I'm sure Damien will be here after he walks Yeah, he goes to visit the nurse. Yeah, the nurse, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the love nurse. Yeah, the love nurse, right. <laughs> um, Caleb and Mike are here? Oh, Mike's here. Is Caleb here? No. What about Aaliyah? I don't think I've seen Caleb. No. Maya? No. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if Maya is here. I bring you this gentleman, and you guys are ass. Man, man. Well, you guys are in I know the good people are here. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Saladin a lot to you. He is our guest speaker for today. He does connect to the Civil Rights Book March, if you could read that. But honestly, guys, the message that he has for you guys is going to spread among the other two books that people write in here. Oh, yeah, you. You go to the love, love doctor, doctor, the love nurse. Gotta keep the girls happy. Okay. <laughs> Um, Saladin will introduce, he'll talk about who he is, what he does for a living, for like life, I don't know. Like this gentleman has impacted people locally, nationally, and internationally, so I will give the floor to him, and then he's going to take questions at the end. If you want to take notes, cool, if you just want to be absorbed in this man's silky smooth velvety voice, and listen to his message, he's such a good friend of mine, here's Saladin. How's everybody doing today? Good. Yeah, good, 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 good. I'm, I'm thankful to have an opportunity to be here with y'all. Anytime I get an opportunity to speak, especially like to your generation, I always take advantage of that opportunity. Because um, I have a lot to share. You know, and you get ready to transition out of high school, you're going to be entering a different phase of your growth and development. And it's important for us who are a little bit older, just a little bit older, to give you some insight and tools so that you can properly navigate your journey moving forward. Um, to give you a little background about myself, um, I'm an early childhood educator, which means my focus is primarily preschool age, but I've worked with youth from preschool all the way up to college age for like 20 years. Um, so as an educator, that's part of who I am, but I'm also a community organizer. So I'm done various different projects, programs, and initiatives, not only in the community that I live in, in Niagara Falls, New York, but also in partnership with other different communities across this country as well. Um, I'm an author. Um, I've published 23 books about various different subjects. Um, a book about secret societies and teaching you about who the Illuminati is and Freemasons, and I have books of poetry. I also have written books about psychology. So one part about, one thing I would say about myself is I'm a lifelong learner. And I identify with the infinite potential within me. Um, a lot of times people identify themselves in various different ways, but they off, oftentimes don't get to the core of who you are. Let me give you an example, right? You hear me speaking right now, this is my voice, right? So my voice belongs to me, but what am I? Because I'm not my voice, it's mine, right? Just like you got on that hoodie right now, you got on those sneakers, though they belong to you. You can clearly see that, right? But your voice also belongs to you. That's yours. It's not you, it belongs to you. Your name, that belongs to you, but it's not you. It's a part of who you are. So you really have to investigate ultimately what you are because that is what you bring with you in any space that you go into. That's really the driving force behind anything that you choose to do in life. And when you realize what you ultimately are, you operate from a place of infinite potential where there is no limitation in what it is just striving to do. There's no insecurity and there's no doubt in that space. Right? Um, what do you want to do when you get a little older? I want to be a game warden. A game warden? Uh -huh. Oh, what is that? What is it's that like a it's like a woods cop kind of just make sure everyone that's like hunting or fishing is doing the right thing. Okay, so what do you do right now that prepares you to be that? You know, the right kid. I spend a lot of time outside in nature, fishing and hunting. So. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So you're preparing yourself. You're living out that part of your purpose already, mm -hmm. right? I taught uh, sixth grade for a while, and sometimes I talk to some of the students and I ask them what do they want to be when they get over. Over the last five years, what do you think they want to be? What y'all think? Astronaut. Astronaut. <laughs> yeah, so. Over the past five years. No, social over the past media. five years. Influencer. What do you think? Social media. Exactly. Influencer. Influencer. Yeah. Influencer. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool. So what are you doing right now? Uh, well, okay. <laughs> 
You know what I mean? You, you have to invest in something like that. You know, it's not nothing you just snap your fingers, you know, and I did a whole lesson on teaching them about the different components of being a, an influencer. You know, somebody that's funny and on camera, you know people are writing those scripts, right? They're not just coming up with all of that on their own. You know the people, you have people who are operating cameras and doing the lighting. You have many different components of that. You don't just simply have to be in front of the camera. So instead of me saying, no, that's challenging, you're not going to be able to do that, I help broaden their perspective in terms of the possibilities of something that they are interested in doing right now. Right? Um, there's three things I want to talk to you about today in regards to just your journey in life. And when I say journey in life, I'm not talking about going and getting a job. Because if, if that was really your destiny, all of the people that you see that out here that have jobs, do you really see a sense of joy in them? Thank you. you don't see that, right? Because ultimately that is not what your destiny is. Your destiny is really to have a purpose in life. What could you do that is a part of your passion that you could fashion into a contribution and share with this world so that you bring more beauty into this world as opposed to sitting back and watch what's broken. And I say that because you have a lot of adults who, as you get older and you become the future leaders, they're gonna hand this world over to you just the way that it is. And a lot of times it's gonna look worse than what it looks right now because they do not care about preparing you for anything. Some, you can feel that in them. I'm telling you straight up, some people are like that. And what you feel is genuine. Some people generally don't care. But you have others, like ourselves, who are part of this type of institution that are in other spaces, and we are here to help prepare you because we want to see more beauty in this world. That is our commitment to you. So when we're sharing things with you, we're sharing knowledge with you, we're sharing wisdom with you, we're sharing understanding with you, it's so that as we depart from this world eventually, we know that it's going to be better off because you are going to be the ambassador of the future that we would like to see. And a lot of us are invested in you because a lot of us are frustrated with people who are our peers, who are older, who don't care. And we would rather be around you who are open-minded and have the capacity to do something better than some of the older people that are here. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Now, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. I'm the third great grandson of a man named Josiah Henson. Now, Who's ever read the book Uncle Tom's Cabin before? Okay. That book is considered the best selling novel of the 19th century and possibly the best selling novel in history. It's called Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was written by this little white woman named Harriet Beecher Stowe, and she wrote about the institution of slavery in the form of a novel. Now, this was the first time that slavery in this country was actually put on public display. Prior to that, people who lived in the South. They knew what was going on. People up in the North was acting like they didn't know what was going on. But when she published this novel, it's like, okay, everybody can't act like they don't know now. So she got a lot of negative backlash because of that. People writing articles and newspapers, editorials, writing other books, doing stage plays, everything they could do to strive to discredit her because she was putting people on front street. This is what's going on in this country. In fact, Abraham Lincoln, who did the Emancipation Proclamation, he checked a copy of that book out of the Library of Congress weeks before he drafted the Emancipation Proclamation. So he was inspired by that book to actually write that legislation to at least end slavery on paper. Because laws don't change people's attitudes, right? And laws are only as strong as the ethics and the morality and the willingness of the people who are able to enforce those laws. Right? So she wrote this story and she got a lot of negative backlash. And she wrote a second book after the key after Uncle Tom's Cabin called The Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now in the second book, she cited all of her references. She talked about who she studied and researched in order for her to come up with her story. And she mentions a man named Josiah Henson and says, This is the central character that this story is based upon. I learned about his life because his biography was circulating amongst abolitionist reading circles, and that's how I learned about who this man was. That is my third great grandfather. So you put it in the context, everybody's familiar with who Harriet Tubman is, correct? Mm -hmm. When Harriet Tubman made her journey to freedom 
from Maryland to the North. He already made that journey years before her. When he made his journey in 1830, she was still a young teen on a plantation and her name was Araminta Ross. So my third great grandfather was a forerunner. He was the type of person that helped construct the Underground Railroad, which gave safe passage for others to come behind him, right? I grew up in a household where I knew this history of my family. During Black History Month, do you do Black History Month here in this school? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you show pictures of different people who are significant in Black History Month? Yes. Typically, they show a picture of a man with an Eskimo Parker on named Matthew Henson. He was considered a person who was the first one to go to the North Pole. Obviously, there were indigenous people that were there, but in terms of exploration, he was considered the first person to go there. That's also one of my family members. Mm -hmm. And you get a good look at me, when you see those images, you'll be like, yeah, they kind of look alike, right? So I knew this as a child. So my self-esteem and confidence was a little different than some of my peers who believed that they came from slaves, right? I grew up in a household where my parents were social and culturally conscious, so they taught me and my siblings about classical civilizations of original people, first world people, black people who taught humanity, who brought civilization and science and mathematics to this world. I knew that as a child. So when I got introduced to the public school system and they had history books with a little passage in there talking about black people came from slaves, I was like, yeah, whatever. That didn't affect me in the same way that it affected some of my peers who did not know how to confront that misinformation <coughs> because they weren't taught anything different, right? In order for you to navigate this society, you have to have a sense of what I call psychological immunity. You have to be able to withstand a different type of attacks on your identity. As a young woman, constantly under attack because this society was not created with you in mind. All you need to do is look at a picture of when the constitution was constructed. You will not see a woman in that picture. Same thing with people who have indigenous ancestry or who are black or brown. We weren't in that picture. So this society was not created with us in interest. We live here though. So what that means is we are, we have the responsibility of creating the path for ourselves in a place that in its infancy did not create a path for us. And that's gonna take some challenges, you know? Your generation right now, generation Z? Z? Z. Z. Okay, I'm, I'm generation X. So my generation did things a little bit different than your generation. Certain language that we used in my generation was a little bit more different than some language that you use. If you look at some of the comedy specials of Generation X and stuff that we were saying, we would be canceled like this from the type of language and the things that we were talking about, but that was the generation that we grew up in. Your generation is a little more sophisticated and articulate when it comes to defining phenomena and reality. So you're responsible for that as well. But at the same time, you're also responsible for learning from my generation and other generations because when you go out, how many people got a job? You're dealing with us, most likely, in another generation. In some ways that we behave and things that we do, you don't like it. The way we talk to you, the way we interact with you, some of that is generational, though. If you want to know how to better navigate those kind of situations and, and deal with us, you have to learn about our generation, which means you got to know the kind of music that we liked. Watch movies that came out during our time period so you can get a better understanding about how we see the world because it's, it's a little different than yours. But then it's also a sense of equality because we have to also be interested in what it is that you're doing now, things that are important to you as well, right? So going back to what I said initially about knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, in order for you to become successful in your undertakings and for you to live a purposeful life, your foundation is knowledge. That's the first thing that's primarily important to you in terms of not just professionally, like a game warden, not just that, but just being a human being, right? Because like I mentioned, 
when this society was established, it wasn't established with certain groups of people in mind. We weren't even at the table, which means the institutions, the way that resources are allocated in the favor of some people, we were not in mind. So you could be from the Lakota tribe, right? That could be your, that could be your, your ancestry. You could be a, from the Lakota tribe. You can come and go through elementary school. You could go through middle school. You can go through high school and never learn nothing about your people at all. Nothing, nothing. You learn about everybody else though because you're just an extra or a supporting actor in their movie. So there's a lot that you're gonna to have to take the initiative to learn on your own because that is also a part of not only building the psychological immunity or for you to be able to withstand the attacks in your identity, but also for you to build your self-esteem and confidence. Do I seem like I'm a little insecure about what I'm talking about? No. Or do I look like I know exactly what I'm talking about? Like there is no doubt. Mm -hmm. I haven't always been like that. There's been periods where I went through trying to find myself because again, the society that I'm growing up in does not reflect who I am or who my people are. I'm turning on TV. I don't see myself as Superman. If it's a villain, they black. Or if I'm watching a religious movie or something, the devil, he black. But I'm not seeing myself in a positive light. Ever. So I have to figure out, like, who am I? What is what 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 contribution do I make to this world? Like I said, thankfully, I had the parents to be able to show me this various aspects of who I was as a person and who I am as a being. But I turn on television now, nah, I don't see myself. Right. Or young black women, they turn on TV. They not seeing. Well, it's different now, but generations ago. You ain't seen no black women on TV as a as a woman that's beautiful. Heck no. Nah. Blonde hair, blue eyes. That's what beauty is. Right? I got a four-year-old daughter. I have to deliberately buy her black dolls. So she don't grow up with a sense of uh, self, uh, low self-esteem or vacant esteem thinking that she's not beautiful because everything she sees on Disney or everything she sees on television shows white girls with long straight hair and blue eyes. I don't want her to grow up with that sense of dysfunction, not valuing who she actually is. But that's the society we grow up in. But guess how we change it? We're a part of that society. And as you get older, you're gonna have active roles of leadership to make decisions to make sure that things are fair and equitable. You're not just leaving high school so you could just go get a job and not do nothing. That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to add more beauty to this world. And that is what you're here for. Because things that you see that are wrong right now, you're going to be a part of the solution. Those of us who are here teaching you and helping provide resources for you and, and help encourage you to be successful in those undertakings, that's what we're here for. Because we want to be proud of saying, dang, they, they're making a difference in this society and in this world. And we were a part of that. Does that make sense to everybody? So now, going back to what I said about knowledge being the foundation, because many of us are not represented, you have to do diligently and you have to take the initiative to learn about yourself and your people. Nobody ain't gonna hand it to you. <laughs> And the more that you learn about yourself and your own identity and your people and the contributions that they made to the world, now you're creating the weaponry to defend yourself and your identity. When people think that all you are is a, as a black male is an athlete and you're not intelligent, you're just a jock, you don't get good. Now you can confront that and deal with that because you're demonstrating something that's the total opposite of that. So you're always going to have to fight. On some level, you always gonna have to fight. At the same time, the more that you learn, you become an advocate for others. One of the things that I was talking to the other class about is knowledge or becoming more aware of who you are, the value of who you are, and what you represent 
now you're in a position to be able to educate others because there's a lot of ignorant people. And I say ignorant, meaning the root word of ignorant is, is ignore. And people have been taught to be ignorant. One time I did a speaking engagement in Vermilion, South Dakota. And Vermilion, South Dakota is, I was speaking at the law school at uh, one of the universities out there. So Vermilion, South Dakota, I think it's like maybe, maybe one or 2% black. And I get out there and for some people, that's the first time that they've seen a black person in real life. I should have made money on getting pictures taken with a black person. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Did that actually happen? Huh? Did they ask to take a picture with you? No, nah, I should have oh. offered them. <laughs> you know what I mean? So because they never been around me, guess where they was getting the information from about what I am as a black man? Yeah. Fox News, rap videos. So some people, they had some kind of twisted perspectives on, on who I actually am, right? So I had to do some education out there. You know, and some people were asking genuine questions, you know, being curious and stuff like that because they're meeting an alien for the first time in their life. You also lessen those opportunities to disrespect people. And you learn how to honor people from where they're at. You learn about things that are important to them, what they value, the way that they raise their families. A lot of us are not taught any of that. So it's not a question whether or not you're going to disrespect or ridicule or marginalize somebody. If you're ignorant, you're going to do it. The question is, how often are you going to be ignorant and disrespect people and ridicule people and marginalize people? to the point where sometimes you may do it and may not have an opportunity to come back from that. What I mean by that is here in school, you may be around your peers and friends and joke around and say certain things here in this school and just go on to your next class or go to the lunchroom. Go do that outside somewhere and see what could potentially happen. The consequences may be entirely different. Now, here's the responsibility to all, all of you. If you know better and your friends are saying stuff that's inappropriate or doing stuff that's inappropriate, <laughs> you just sit back and not say nothing. And then you find out later on that they were out here in the community or in some space doing that and something happened to them. You're partly responsible because you knew better. You knew better. So if you look at my shirt, right? Stand against racism. That means that you have to take a stand not only against stuff like racism and sexism and ableism or any kind of ism, but you have to be that person that is in that environment that is a safe space for others <coughs> to be who they are. You are a part of leading your own peers because you've been invested in knowledge. A lot of people who are here at school and some of y'all in this room, you just learn here because you get just got to get a grade. That's just the basic standard of your growth and development. But there's some of you who take an extra step and you take initiative to learn a little bit more than what's expected of you. That puts you in a different class than everybody else. That's more of a leadership class. So the more that you know, the more knowledge that you have, the more you become an asset for wisdom. So what's wisdom in relationship to knowledge? Knowledge is awareness, it's consciousness, it's knowing, it's information. Wisdom is the use of knowledge, how to apply it, right? Knowledge is, you may live in a community that you don't need to lock your doors or your car door, people ain't really going to steal nothing. That, that may be knowledge. Wisdom is making sure you lock your door anyway because you don't want to tempt nobody to do it. It's different. It's the application of what you know. Wisdom is also discernment or right judgment. So you can only be wise or make wise moves if you know something first. Like I told the other class, if you're interested in a partner, knowledge is learning about who they are, asking questions, seeing who they were with before, what their grades are like, what their personality is. That's knowledge. So that now you're in a position to make a wise decision whether or not you want that person to be your partner. 
if you just jump right in there and you don't do the knowledge on anything, you don't want to know nothing about them, most of the time you're going to regret that decision because you did things backwards. You try to make a wise decision and you don't know nothing first. So the proper order of things is always knowledge and wisdom. You have to learn first. That gives you the capacity to make wiser decisions. In relationship to what I'm talking about, the more that you learn to advocate for yourself, you become a leader to advocate for others. So now there's a way that you have to move. One thing that I experienced recently is I work at the Niagara Falls Underground Railroad Heritage Center. Right, so this society that we live in is mostly male dominant, right? You look at a lot of institutions and it's males from the top and you oftentimes see women who are not in those kind of positions, right? Even when you look at statistically for the same exact type of profession, typically males are paid more than women. And a lot of times women are doing more of the work. That's just facts, right? At the Underground Railroad, we have a team of different people that work there. We have some younger women that work on the team. Um, I'm a director of community engagement there. So sometimes the guests are coming to the space, and if we're all standing there talking, they just come and automatically and start talking to me like, like I'm the authority figure in you know in the situation, right? Now, if I'm ignorant. I would just automatically just engage them and not pay no attention to my team members who are younger women, not realizing that I'm actually minimizing their power and their sense of, of being in that space as equal to me. I just start engaging them. Yeah, 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 you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't do that because I'm aware. I have knowledge. So my wisdom is if they come in and they're starting to try to engage me like I'm the authority figure, I step aside and redirect them to that, to the, some of my team members. Or I might not even ask them to ask the question or answer the question. I might just turn to one of my team members. If they ask me something like, yes, yeah, that third, I'll be like, um, do you know so-and-so? Even though when you think about like in terms of chain of command, I'm the director, I do that purposely and step out of the way. Because a lot of times young women are not afforded that sense of representation. Like I said, it goes back to the way this country was founded. Does that make sense to everybody? That's wisdom that I'm talking about. Being able to move in a certain type of way. Right? People who classify themselves as white. A lot of times they take up a lot of dang space. Because they're used to being in a society where they are the leading actor. Everybody else, it ain't your movie. They're the directors, they're the executive producers. Every role in terms of leadership is how they establish the society. And all of us, we're extras or supporting actors. And some people generationally have been used to being a star of the show. And they move like that. Right? My mother was a social psychologist. So she knew a lot in terms of behavioral sciences and how to interact with people. And one of the things that she used to tell me is a lot of times white males, because they're used to and accustomed to being in the leadership position and of authority, they always think that they need to be primarily recognized. So let me give you an example. If I'm sitting here having a conversation with him, right? and a white male comes into the room, they may expect us to stop our conversation and automatically get this person attention and start talking to him. Because they're used to that. They're in that authority position. I deliberately don't. I deliberately, okay, yeah, we're still talking. When we're finished talking, then we can have that conversation. I don't care who you are. I acknowledge that you're there, but we're finishing our conversation because our conversation is just as important as what it is that you need to say. You're not more important. That's wisdom, right? These are things that you learn, but these are also things that you're not necessarily taught in school. These are life skills. And these are things that are important as you move out of this space and you become leaders in this society that you know how to navigate and how to also advocate for and support other people 
who are going through the same things. Because you're also building confidence and esteem so that other people know like, okay, I don't have to cower or I don't have to concede to people. I can comfortably be myself as well. I don't have to act other than who I am. Or cold switch. Anybody know what cold switching is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Huh? It's a great term to bring up. No. You guys don't you know, know this? Cold switching. Cold switching is um, people talk differently around certain people. Yeah, like, like what? Yeah, like what's an example? Oh, well, like, uh, like I'm talking to my friend, and I don't like I'm not very like proper, but if I'm talking to like my boss, I'll I'll use a different language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, so. Oprah. Yeah. So yeah. So some of my. She's been accused of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of my uh, students that I'm working with, I say like in like sixth grade, stuff like that. Sometimes when they're around me, they speak a certain way, but when they're around their friends, they be cussing and stuff. Oh. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So they cold switch when they come around me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I respect it, the fact that they want to speak in a certain way around me, but at the same time, I let them know like, yo, you're not really being yourself around me because I'm not really learning about who you are. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Sometimes people cold switch to be accepted by other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The same way I'm talking to y'all right now, I don't switch that up. I don't care who I'm talking to. I speak the exact same way. I don't change, hey, how are you doing today? <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> when I'm teaching class with my students, they come in, I'm like, yo, what's going on? How you doing? Why are you talking like that, Mr. Sa? I'm like, yo, how you expect me to talk? What you want me to say? <laughs> this is who I am. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And it's important to represent and be in those spaces like that. Because a lot of times people don't see it. And and what's what's your title here at the school? Uh, principal. Okay, so when I just met him a few minutes ago, right at the front door, and I'm like, a word? That's the principal? <laughs> Because I can see myself in him. He know exactly what I'm talking about. Because in order for him to be in that type of position, he's had to learn how to navigate at the same time. Be himself at the same time. But that inspires other ones that look like him. Like, dang, I could be a principal too and rock a hoodie like this? <laughs> because they expect to see somebody, you know, acting a certain way and... When you're being other than yourself, it's, it's hard for people to understand each other if, if they don't know nothing about each other and if they're not using wisdom in order to deal with each other as well, right? So, mm -hmm. do I got any questions before before we leave? I know I gave you a lot to think about, but at the end of the day, you know, realize that that we love you. I don't know how many people just tell you that directly. Mr. Baker does every day. Okay, that's that's what I'm talking about, and we are proud of you, and you're gonna make a difference. You're gonna make a difference, and that's why we're even here. Because we could do so much to bring some beauty to this world, but y'all are gonna be the ones to change a lot of things that we see, and we have confidence in you to be able to do that. Could you just talk very quickly about where this place is located yeah. and just how you're involved? Okay. Two minutes of it. So Niagara Falls Underground Railroad Heritage yeah. Center, I'm one of about 300 people that help establish the institution. It's in Niagara Falls, New York, and we focus on underground railroad history that happens specifically in the city of Niagara Falls. Mm -hmm. So if you come down and check it out, I'll give you a tour, give your family a tour, and share some of the stories of everyday people who have done extraordinary things, just like y'all are everyday people who are gonna do extraordinary things. This is just related to the Underground Railroad, but you see those same type of everyday people doing extraordinary things in every aspect of life. Did you guys learn about the Underground Railroad in history? Mm -hmm. A little bit. Not in Niagara Falls. Not in Niagara Falls. Yeah. 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 middle school, that's the Yeah, yeah. so Harry yeah. Tubman crossed the Niagara Falls in November of 1856. So this area is yeah. vitally important Massive. because this is the last stop for people yeah. to get across yeah. the Canadian side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is what? a very important area in terms of the Okay, network. we've got a great question. Why don't we talk about that? I've always thought that was an important thing. Like, you got a lot of people had to come through here 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why isn't there any stories that are coming to us about this? Um, I think your question is in your, the, the answer is in your question. You said that it's important. You Because you see that it's important, right? Okay. Other people, they don't see that as important. Mm -hmm. You know? And as a younger person, how we change that narrative is we make sure that younger generations have these stories so they realize the value and importance of them. Yeah. You know, and we can't rely on other people to do it for us. We got to do it for ourselves. Saladin and I talk about a field trip. You yeah. guys are up for it. I'm up for it. Yeah. I mean, we can check this place out. We could go Michigan Street, the corridor there, learn about African American heritage. I think all in. Yeah. Be great. Yeah, so we get um and throughout the month of Black History Month, we um we get a grant through MT Bank and we do free field trips. So we provide the transportation as well as the admission to our site. So That's wonderful. Um, once once we get uh, uh information back, I'm gonna share it with all of you. So that yeah. good plan for bringing some students out to our site. So valuable for you guys to see these mm -hmm. cultural heritage centers. Mm -hmm. But people who are passionate about it, mm -hmm. you know. Great. Yeah. All right, let's go on. Love the message. Yeah. Okay. Uh, tomorrow, guys, we're back in the essay. If you want to use Saladin, if you weren't here yesterday, we started talking about an essay about tolerance, intolerance. Yeah. So, a question. What up? About like trying to educate yourself more. So, like, how are specific yeah. topics it's gonna be like mm -hmm. a or just in general? Year. No, we're just like two. We can do like a tip. One pager. Yeah, yeah. Just focus on them. Always what? Always. Was there a yacht today? I know I saw that when I was like, oh, maybe it's a yacht. I was like, oh, maybe it's a yacht. You really got to do this. I thought I had it bad when I was just like, nah, I'm just creating areas for people to feel like themselves. Or just like to be able to feel yeah. connected you through like yeah. security, yeah. Like yeah. understanding yeah. of the people. Yeah. 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 What channel do you watch it first? What do you like watching on TV? Yes, they use the I'm just like, I know, I might be cool, but still, I'll probably just watch it. That's a good question. TV doesn't really exist that much. Social media. Yeah, yeah. I know you're going to your class.